for, um, sorry about that. Um, welcome everybody to this month's presenter series. We've got Scott, Dr. Scott Dust here with us and we're really honored to have him here um, to speak to us on his work in strategic agility, which um, it's been a kind of a recurring request to have somebody come and speak to us on this from our members. Um, so very excited that he's here. Um, before we get started, and since we have a lot of guests, um, I'd like to share some of the couple of ground rules for our time together. Um, and if anybody, there's some background noise on somebody, if you can mute, um, or maybe Fiona, you can mute them. Um, we always have been a no-selling environment, so we want to keep it that way. We've always had a promise of confidentiality in all of our sessions, so what's said in this room stays in the room. Um, no politics, because for the 18 years that we've been running this organization, it always works better to keep it that way. And nothing's ever personal. Um, so um, take all the comments constructively, and um, because we're just all here to be helpful and supportive to one another. So very straightforward with those. Um, the cadence of this national program, or we have all of our local forums, but this is a national program that's open to all of our members and guests. And we hold two of these each month. Um, we try to stick to the second Friday, morning and the fourth Tuesday afternoons and occasionally the holidays get in the way but we try to stick to that on most months. Um, this is the speaker series and these are always recorded and we post them to the COE forum for members to view later. Um, these sessions are always open to members, guests, and all of our forum directors and we may often have thought leaders who join us to kind of get a feel for what you're wa wanting to hear more about and understand what kind of questions you're asking so they can best prepare for their sessions. And we always invite our directors to these sessions as well so they can learn and also share with their members. So you'll see a mix of people in these, in these meetings. Um, the executive session, on the other hand, is held each month and it's, it's led by our ambassadors, such as Josh Reniker and his team. And they're reserved for members and invited guests only, and we'll never record those for confidentiality. Um, as many of you know, we have fostered and continue to build partnerships with organizations that provide wonderful benefits for our members, including Armada Intelligence, whose partner Chris Keel frequents these sessions to update us on the economy. We also have partnerships with Cloverleaf, Double Gemini, Jerry Starcia, who's here with us today. And we continue to work with a few others to provide value from onboarding to being on a board. And Dr. Dust represents Cloverleaf as their chief research officer. Um, with that, I would love to get started on the introduction. I'm gonna let Scott talk to the topic and what he's gonna cover, because that's why he's here today. But let me just give you a little background to Scott. Um, Scott Dust, PhD. He's an associate professor of management at the Feely Family Endowed Chair of the Center for Entrepreneurship at the Carl H. Linder College of Business at the University of Cincinnati. He is also the chief research officer, as I mentioned at Cloverleaf, which is a Cincinnati-based HR tech platform that facilitates coaching insights. He earned his PhD in management and organizational behavior at the Laval College of Business, Drexel University, and his BS and MBA from the Kelly School of Business, Indiana University. His primary areas of research are leadership, leader-follower relationships, and teams. Dr. Dust has published 30 peer-reviewed articles in um, over 30 peer-reviewed articles in leading academic journals, including the Journal of Applied Psychology, Personnel Psychology, and Journal of Organizational Behavior, Leadership Quarterly, and Human Relations. He currently serves on the editorial review board of the Journal of Organizational Behavior, the Journal of Social Psychology, and Group and Organization Management. He's consulted internationally on human capital assessment and design and leadership development initiatives and is a regular contributor to Fast Company, Business Insider, and Psychology Today. In addition to Dr. Dust, today we're joined by his colleague at Cloverleaf, Nick Scott. You can wave, Nick. Um, and I, I, one thing I'm going to do a little differently today is we have a very short four-question survey at the end of this session. It should take no more than 30 seconds to just give us some feedback on Scott's um, presentation and content, and more importantly, on having him back with us at another time on some other topics that he could present to us. Um, that's a lot. Sorry, sorry to be so winded, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. It is all yours. Thanks so much. Thank you for the warm introduction and generous introduction. I appreciate it. I'm super excited to talk with this group today. This is a fun topic, and hopefully this entire presentation doesn't come across as a lecture. 
I'm not the typical professor. I, I require engagement and experiential learning because it's more fun, but that's also how we learn the best. So super excited to, to work through and talk with everybody today. And this really should be a dialogue. Don't, don't hesitate, come off mute, raise your hand, send something in the chat. That'll make this way more fun. You know, we've got, let's see, 36 people on the line. This will be great to get some uh, interactive dialogue between everybody here. So I'm gonna make sure I share my screen. So I want to make sure you guys can see everything okay. All right. Can I get some thumbs up? Can you guys see that okay? Awesome. All right. So, um, yes, I have two roles, and they both actually overlap quite a lot. And Laura spoke to this a second ago in that as a practitioner, I work with Cloverleaf, which is really an, a new and, and interesting approach to coaching, which is a subset of leadership and development, which is automated coaching, using technology to scale this ability to offer insights that help people grow and develop as individuals, as well as in teams. And I've been a part of Cloverleaf for three years, and I was just blown away when I first met the Cloverleaf team because I've been researching and teaching this stuff for over a decade and always very interested in how leadership influence should work, how self-awareness should work. How do you actually work through and make behavioral changes for yourself and within team environments? And so to see it actually happening in practice has been uh, a lot of fun. And so that's kind of where the two are, are adjoined. Um, in this presentation, I really do my best to what I call bridge the gap between science and practice. So I am an academic, right? And I publish in these super nerdy journals that use lots of mumbo jumbo about statistical analysis and research methods. I am not gonna bog you guys down with any of that stuff. Instead, I take all of this uh, relatively esoteric incremental social science information and turn it into something that is tangible, practical and actionable so that you all can experience it in these 90 minutes and then also grapple with it on your own. And I'm gonna kind of give some exercises and there'll be some breakouts and reflections that you can work through today. So that when you leave this 90 minute presentation, you actually can use it, right? So that's that bridging the gap between science and practice. But I also would love to geek out on any of the really specific uh, research, evidence, or whatever you might be interested in to give you some of that uh, additional background that goes into some of the recommendations today. So here is the agenda. Uh, number one, you know, what exactly is strategic agility? So I'll do a fun little breakout, uh, or not a breakout, a, a poll to get us started to really illustrate what we're getting ready to talk about. And then I'm going to walk through four dimensions of strategic agility. And so it would be a wonderful experience. It'd be a great day if by the end of this 90 minutes, you just remembered what those four dimensions are, right? Just to have enough information, enough context, and enough experiential opportunities to really work through these four dimensions. So for each one of these four dimensions, we'll do a poll to kind of make it come to life. I'll give you a little bit of content, a few slides to describe what it is. And then we'll talk about uh, this together, either in breakout rooms or as a reflection, and then I'll give some final takeaways. So that's where we're headed, but I really strongly believe in what's called <clears throat> the learn, do, say, reflect mantra. As being a, a faculty member who's taught, who's taught online for years now, forced to by COVID, but also before COVID became a thing, um, and understanding the best practices for making sure you actually can use and learn, I think that's where we're headed. So, okay. I wanna introduce you to a few characters. This, inf this person right here, this is, uh, this is not Nick Scott. Our, um, this is not our, uh, our Cloverleaf representative today, believe it or not. This is Tom Stoltman. He is a world champion and the world's strongest man. I don't know if you can count how many plates are on there. It's like seven or eight plates. Each one is 45 pounds or so. He's considered one of the world's strongest men. I mean, he does crazy stuff like can throw full kegs over his head like a hundred feet. He can put straps around his shoulders and pull semi trucks a uh, hundred yards. I mean, that's the kind of stuff the, these folks do. And so what I want you to think about as I go through these characters 
is which one do you identify with the most as it relates to how you perform at work? Okay, so this is character number one, Tom Stoltman. Are you the world's strongest person? Or number two, are you more like a Chrissy Wellington? Chrissy Wellington is one of my favorites. She is one of the most winning Ironman world champions of all time. She won like four Ironman championships in a row. And Ironman, for those that don't know, is a swim bike run. So you swim 2.4 miles, you bike 112 miles, and then you do a marathon, a 26.2 mile run afterwards. Um, I actually met my wife at a Ironman. We went to this Ironman uh, for our honeymoon where Chrissy Wellington won this uh, world championship, I think for the third or fourth time in a row. So maybe Chrissy Wellington is somebody that you identify with in terms of your work performance. Here's the third character. Many of you probably know Usain Bolt. So Usain Bolt considered one of the fastest people of all time in the world, right? Known for all of his Olympic gold medals in sprinting. I particularly like this cheeky picture here where he's kind of taunting the people that are a full step or two behind him. Right, so there's your, your three characters. And again, this is the poll and Laura will pull up the poll in just a second here. But I want you to think about the following athletes and which one do you identify with the most as it relates to how you work. Strength with Tom Holtman, endurance with Chrissy Wellington or speed with Usain Bolt. Go ahead. I'm going to end it because it's at 97 percent and that's probably me and you scott <laughs> that's good yep all right what did we find we have for strength nine percent we got endurance 79 percent. that's the category i would fall into as well just kind of persist hang in there for as long as it takes in speed 12 percent of the population okay very good now i've kind of forced you to identify with one of these characters but what I want to present to you is an alternative. I want to introduce you to another character, Tia Claire Tume. Tia Claire Tume is one of the best all-time CrossFit athletes of all time. And she is known for being able to do all three, speed, endurance, and strength. And thinking of the CrossFit athlete is a great metaphor for what we're thinking about in terms of strategic agility. Right? We know within work, things change. You have to flex different strengths and weaknesses. You have to overcome different blind spots at any one point in time, depending upon what the circumstances are. What are your strengths, weaknesses, and abilities? Maybe what do your team members or your direct reports or even your superiors, your managers, or your partners as CEOs, what do they need in the given moment? And then where do we find ourselves in terms of the situation? Are we in crisis mode or are we smooth sailing? Are we a startup or are we a, a well-established 10,000 pound gorilla within the organizational work environment? So if I could, I could plug a visual in your mind of what we want to think about and embrace when it comes to a strategic, agile mindset, think of the CrossFit athlete because we need to be able to adjust and adapt as necessary to do what's required given the situation that we find ourselves in. And this relates to an individual as well as a team perspective. And we're gonna walk through these four dimensions that are representative of this strategic agility mindset. So here's the preview. Here's the four terms that by the end of this presentation, I hope you remember. Number one is forward thinking. Number two is managing risk. Number three is collaborative transparency. And then finally, an agile mindset. Okay, so we're going to walk through each one of these and have some, some fun experiences together. Sound good? We'll get some, some high fives, thumbs up. Everybody's good? All right. Okay, so forward thinking. Here's number one. Forward thinking can be illustrated in a few different dimensions of organizational behavior, but probably one of the most well-established constructs that we're interested in when we're looking at organizational behavior are different types of performance. So think of it this way. For years, years, decades actually, all we were really interested in 
as organizational decision makers, managers, or even uh, leaders of our organization was evaluating performance, individual performance, team performance, organizational performance. And we are really, really good at creating d job descriptions and clear explanations on what somebody needs to do in order to be a high performer. Right? Think about our performance development systems. It's all written in there. It's pretty clear. We have some specific objectives and what we want this role to do. But I think the old adage of your job description becomes out of date on the second day of work is pretty apt for many of us that are in an organizational environment, right? Your role changes, the situation changes. And so it's really important to understand that there's actually three different types of performance. The first one is task performance, which really is about being proficient in the predictable demands of your situation. These are the things that are plugged into the management uh, job description, for example. But there's two others that are super important. First is adaptive performance. This is the ability to adjust given unforeseen demands, things that you just can't predict. The third is proactive performance, which is your ability to think ahead and work ahead and do things now that are gonna help you given the fact that things inevitably will evolve and change in the future, right? So being able to communicate with your colleagues, with your direct reports, with your peers, or even being self-aware enough yourself to be able to understand where am I really flexing and where do I really need to improve? Task, adaptive, or proactive performance. So I want to do another poll to try and get a feel for where people are and really kind of be self-critical here and think about this. And which of the following performance types are you the strongest, right? And you might be high, medium, low on all three, but I'm really going to force you to pick one. Which one are you the strongest on? Task, adaptive, or proactive? All right, here we go. The results are in. So task performance at 12%, adaptive performance at 76%, proactive mm -hmm. performance at 12%. Okay, so a few tidbits. Number one, everybody ideally is good at task performance, right? Like that's something that's kind of the baseline. Like everybody should be able to do whatever the objectives are that have been laid out are predictable and are expected of us. But in addition, being able to adapt, it's wonderful. Three-fourths of the population here is saying this is their, their biggest strength of the three. To be able to adjust is very much representative of that agile mindset. But as well, proactive performance, that might be an opportunity for improvement for all to try and creep that up to maybe being one of our top performance abilities as well, to be able to think towards the future and do things now that are able to, uh, to facilitate growth. So I'm going to tell a little story about the different types of performance for myself. I'm gonna use a personal story. And then I'm gonna offer an opportunity for everybody here to do uh, a little bit of a breakout session and talk mm -hmm. about these breakdowns and different types of performance. So introduce my two little beans here. This is Caroline and Louisa Dust, my seven-year-old and five-year-old. This was a uh, My Little Pony fifth a uh, five-year-old birthday here. So I know all of the My Little Ponies. <laughs> better believe I know all their superpowers. I know all their cutie marks, as they're called. And Caroline and Louisa, they really, really like chicken noodle soup. I mean, that is all these little humans want to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So in terms of task performance, if my role as a parent is to just make sure they have something in their body, Right, something that is keeping them running, something that is like making sure they uh, have enough energy to make it through the day. You know, it's 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 okay. It's fine that they eat this the majority of the hours of the day. Right, task performance. I solved the problem. There's food in their stomach. <laughs> but I know in the future, if they continue to eat chicken noodle soup three times a day, seven days a week, you know what's going to happen? Inevitably, over time they're not growing as, as much as they could. You know, they're gonna to start to have GI problems. They're gonna have, uh, you know, probably attention span issues because they're not getting their greens and everything out, whatever you can add in there for, you know, the obvious health and wellness concerns. Right, so I have to engage in some 
proactive performance and think about the future. What's actually going to happen if this continues? And the other part of this is figuring out how am I going to make this work to make it change? So engaging in some adaptive performance, right? So I got to start experimenting. So we had a whole plan together. The COOs in the room, I'm sure would appreciate this, right? Let's experiment. I'm going to try some sweet potatoes. Then I'm going to try some edamame. And then I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I just did a bunch of little experiments to try and force them to do it. Yes, I used bribery. Yes, I did all sorts of things that you're not supposed to do. But I made sure that I tried to ensure that we adapted and changed their behavior. And it worked over time, right? So the self-reflection I want to offer for you is similar, right? So I just gave a, a simple personal example. But what's something at work where you might be able to exhibit these two more agile mindset types of performance? So adaptive performance and or proactive performance. So we're going to do some uh, randomized breakout rooms. We'll put you into breakout rooms of three and give you about five minutes to discuss this key prompt. What's something at work where you might be able to exhibit adaptive and or proactive performance? And don't hesitate as well to adjust the question a bit for you. So maybe something you've done recently that you feel like is representative of adaptive or proactive. Some significant concern you're having right now, or maybe even putting it to the language of how you're working as COOs today. So we'll let you do the breakouts. We will bring you back in or give you the timer for one minute at about four minutes. So. Do your best to, to keep it concise. All right, looks like we got almost everybody. And it should be, yeah, I think this is everybody. All right, welcome back. Hope you guys had a good discussion. Offer a few examples, put this into your own terms and your own experiences. I would love to have a few people discuss whatever it was that came up during your conversations. If we could get two or three volunteers, that'd be fantastic. And we can all together maybe riff on this information of experiences and really kind of pick apart why it's important, how hard it is, and how to set ourselves up for some of these types of performance. Any volunteers? I'll jump in. Um, so our group, uh, wide ranging. So we had some government work, we had uh, some stuff in healthcare, and then I'm in manufacturing. So talked about uh, massive growth and being able to kind of proact or uh, react or adapt to changing org charts and how to support rapid growth as you're growing a team. Um, for yeah. me, it was electronics manufacturing. So you may have heard of component issues and supply chain issues, uh, just mm -hmm. a reaction to all of that and keeping us afloat. Um, and then on a government side, nonprofit side, reacting to kind of what's in the news and what's going on in, in, in the media and being able to react to that and leverage that uh, in real yeah. time. So those are the three main things that came out of ours. Yes. So great examples of the impetus being the environment, right? Whether it's it's the social environment, the, the supply-oriented environment, or whatever it might be that's forcing you to react and adjust and adapt. And this aligns with like the organizational change management literature that highlights how hard it is to sometimes get people out of their current course of action and move towards a new course of action. And leaders like yourself are constantly having to say, hey, we have to adjust, we have to adapt. If you don't, the repercussions are not good, right? So it's it's hard to get people to change, but you're being able to articulate, hey, the environment has changed, therefore we must have new practices and, and move forward. That's really good. Anybody else? Uh, Catherine, Stephen, and I talked a similar vein. We talked about the difficulty of changing a, a startup from original product to a market required product versus what the founders wanted it to be. We talked uh, about the change in systems required as you grow an organization that it becomes, you have to change systems because your original systems won't carry you to growth. Um, and the challenges associated with that it was interesting across the various industries. Yeah, and that's, and that's great. I love that one. That example is great because it also kind of intertwines the proactive and, and the adaptive in that you almost have to remind all parties that where we are today is not where we're going to be in the future because what got us here is not going to get us to the next stage. 
So it's like setting the baseline, setting the groundwork for we have to be proactive and being that proactive mindset involves paying attention to the surroundings and adapting and experimenting and iterating in the moment, in the process to eventually get towards where we need to be for growth. So yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, especially in that growth mode challenge, you know, if it's not part of the lexicon and the language already, it can be really tough to do it on a regular basis. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Um, actually, we can, we kind of got actually more about the roles of the COO as how it sort of applies. The fact that, you know, most everyone say they want to be more um, proactive, that there's something that they work on. But part of the role is just you are sort of the um, adaptive person because, you know, in reality, the, the d division of duties is the CEO should be the long term divisionary. And which yeah. means that as the COO, you are dealing with the daily grind. And mm -hmm. as much as you try, to focus on the proactive, everyone in the organization comes to you with their problems, right? So you're yeah. adapting and you're juggling all the different parts. And yeah. being former military, as I said, you know, no plan for, survives first contact with the enemy. So no matter how proactive you are and how well things are planned out mm -hmm. in the execution, there's always, always something you have to adapt. So that's kind of, some of it, you're just kind of forced into that as a COO of being Absolutely. adaptive. Absolutely. Yeah, which actually makes a lot of sense why three-fourths of the of the group is basically saying adaptive is my number one. Because based upon your role, your day-to-day -day responsibilities, that is almost what you're being required to do. That makes a lot of sense. And what's also interesting, there's a lot of research on planning. And sometimes proactive planning can actually end up halting the ability to adapt and adjust because people get so ingrained in what that initial plan was. It's like, hey, we spent all this time and all this effort coming together to say, this is what we're gonna do. And then they fail to actually adapt in the moment. So it's almost like, if anything, the proactive part of our role as COOs is to say, this is the plan. Planning helps because it helps us think through all the potential contingencies. But when we get in the moment, we have to adapt. Right. So it's like you can have a proactive conversation about what it really means to be um, adaptive and proactive. These are fantastic. Anybody else? Uh, this is uh, Crystal. Was, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead, Crystal. Uh, Kat, Deborah, and I talked about um, organizational planning, so annual strategic planning and how you adapt every year also to make sure that each department's goals are integrated together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Deborah talked about needing to adapt from task to adaptive strategies in helping startups um, grow mm -hmm. and move. And then I talked about um, organizational staff planning and formation. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a small company where everybody's done everything mm -hmm. for so long that we're trying mm -hmm. to move into defined roles, but planning for future needs and adapting to the skills that we have right now is is my challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I sit on the leadership team at Cloverleaf and what you just described is exactly what we described too, right? Like we are major growth mode and we're looking at how expensive it's going to potentially be to be to have all of these new lines that every different department needs. And we're having these circular conversations of, well, this is what I want, but if we don't hit these specific objectives, then we're going to have to renegotiate who goes where and who's the priority position. So absolutely, that's a great example of like, you, you have proactive performance and thinking it through and planning, but you also have to be prepared to adapt in the moment. Great example. So Daryl, uh, Mark, and I talked about uh, just having to be adaptive to today's environment they were dealing with, with the, the inflationary pressure that we're all experiencing, but at the same time, recognizing that it's probably not going to go back to normal and that we've yeah. got to be proactive in thinking ahead, trying to figure out what it's going to look like in the future rather than uh, just expecting it to go back to the way that it was. Yeah, absolutely. And... A lot of times in senior level positions like yours, the, the, the literature is called sense-making literature, right? You have to help make sense of the situation and be able to role model for everybody else that works for you to be able to reformulate what the future actually is going to be like and what situations mean. So instead of this being 
hey, the inflationary pressure is creating crisis mode. It's the inflationary pressure is creating lots of changes. And if we do it right, we're going to win and the competitors are going to lose. Right. It's a very it's a very different framing for like, how are we actually going to adjust and adapt in the moment? Uh, but another great example. These are great. All right. Any other dying contributions? Just I can't wait to to push it out there. You want to keep going? These are good. All right. These are good. We'll have plenty more opportunities for good, uh, good interaction like this. I love when we can put it into your own terms of like what it actually is like out there for your specific role. So, okay. Here, oops, wrong way. Here's the takeaways uh, for the forward thinking, the first dimension. So number one, focus on building your comfort level with adaptivity and proactivity. Doesn't sound like many people have a lot of challenge with this, but it is going to be important that you start building in and, and helping others within your organizations start to have these mindsets and these abilities as well, right? Being able to have that language when you're training people, when you're mentoring people, coaching people, help them see the difference between those three, because then you can have a, a more sophisticated conversation about what their expectations are. I've been a, I was a horrible manager before I was an academic. You know, I was basically holding people accountable for being adaptive and proactive, but all I was really doing was giving them task performance oriented directions, right? So as managers, we have to get into that mindset. And then number two, design an approach for seeking out what to change and how to change it. And for everybody, this will be different, right? But taking the time to think in advance about how are we actually gonna go about being proactive and adaptive is, is important. Okay, awesome. Let's do poll number two to get started setting the framing for the second dimension. So this is a, uh, a there is a, correct answer to this specific poll. So um, this is based upon research. Successful entrepreneurs have what level of risk orientation? Is it A, it's low. Let's slow down and think about this. Is it B, moderate? It depends. Or A, or excuse me, C, is it high? Go big or go home? I'll give you a moment to think here. What do you think it is? All right, and the results are in. So, successful entrepreneurs, what level of risk orientation? 7% said, low. <laughs> let's slow down and think about this. 47% uh, are at moderate, so it says it depends, and then 47% equally said, hi, go big or go home. So, the correct answer is moderate. The answer is B. And, um, I'll explain the reasoning here in a second after I explain what exactly risk orientation is. So risk orientation is all about how much information do you need in order to take action and that action might have uncertain outcomes. And it's all based upon this information-based perspective that says, number one, those that are low in risk orientation say, I need complete information. I want to know everything going on. I want to know all the variables, all the inputs. And then those that are low orientation also are uncomfortable with technical information, perhaps information that is not their expertise, things that they don't understand, things that are very complicated and there's no way to fully get their arms around everything. And then number three, those that are low in risk orientation, they do not like alternative information sources. They wanna be the ones to have the information and find the information themselves. On the other extreme, right? So those that are high in risk orientation, they're more than fine taking action Action and taking risks based upon incomplete information, maybe not understanding everything and how it works, and then relying on others for the source of the information. So research does illustrate those that are moderate actually are the best entrepreneurs. So this is really actually more challenging than what it sounds like to be moderate in our approach to risk orientation. And that we don't want people that just take a blind leap of faith in order to get to the other side. The best entrepreneurs, those that are able to create something from scratch and improve and grow a business, or internally, those corporate entrepreneurs, they're willing to take the risk, but they need that helping hand. They need that support of some degree of information 
some degree of understanding and some understanding of like, where did this information come from? So risk orientation to do it right and have the best agile mindset as it relates to risk is not about just taking the leap and saying, I'm just going to go for it. That's not being agile. Being agile entails A, establishing information thresholds. How much do I really need in order to feel comfortable? Because it's all about probabilities and risk management, right? What's enough? Also establishing key information, right? If I can only have one item out of all of the 10 items that I really want, what would that item be, right? What's the number one source that I feel is like going to give me the, the most weight in terms of being able to make a good decision? Number three, get really, really good at finding experts and also trusting those experts when they do give you input. Right? We actually aren't very good at seeking out who is the best at this. We feel comfortable doing it ourselves or asking somebody internally to do it. Ideally, we get more comfortable paying for those that actually do have the expertise to make sure they do it right and then actually trust them once they give us that information. And then the last one is utilizing what's called complementarity. And so a lot of times our risk orientation is relatively innate. Right? So you just, based upon your makeup and your, your, uh, your different psychographics, you might be low on risk orientation or high on risk orientation. But I've done some research that evaluates how you can pair up with other individuals and or other team members to complement each other in order to capitalize on this concept of moderate risk orientation. So for example, if I am low on risk orientation, which I am, if I partner with somebody that's high on risk orientation, interestingly, that is the best case scenario for making me more creative and innovative. Because what happens is it leads to what's called intellectual stimulation. If I'm coming at something from one angle and another person's coming at something from a very different angle, together, if we're collaborating and really working on how we're ex uh, extrapolating all these different options and different opinions and different suggestions for how to go about the information exchange, we settle on something that is much more unique. We create synergy out of whatever it is that we've disagreed on in terms of our traditional innate characteristics. And so in this research, we, we illustrate that uh, employees and managers, when they work together, it didn't matter whether the employee was low or high on risk orientation, the more divergent they were from their managers actually led to the highest level of intellectual stimulation, which in turn led to the most creativity and innovation, which is fascinating. And this gets into, and, and Nick will talk about Cloverleaf here in a second, is understanding that we're all unique, right? We all come at things differently. The best that we can do is say, I'm self-aware of who I am. I'm other aware of who you are. How can we complement each other in a way that's going to lead to the best possible outcome for all? all right, so risk orientation is a great example of that. Okay, for this one, instead of doing breakout rooms, what we're going to do is a self-reflection just using a little bit of a, a writing exercise, right? Like a journaling exercise. So I'll give you these two prompts. I'll give you two minutes to think about it. Maybe type it out on your notes or even write it out uh, on paper and pen or whatever it works for you or even put it in the chat if you so like. And think about these prompts. What's one example of a situation where you were held up because you were afraid to take a risk? And what's one thing you could have done to help get more comfortable with this risk? And so let's offer some examples. I'm sure as professionals in your position, you've had lots of these. I'm gonna put you on the clock here, two minutes. One more minute.
All right, time's up. So let's do the same we did last time, get some uh, ideas from the group and start to riff on this idea of risk orientation a little bit. So again, the challenge sometimes is, you know, we want, we want all the information, but we're not gonna get all the information, right? The ideal way to grow and develop, especially in the entrepreneurship uh, realm is being this moderate risk taker. So anybody willing to come off mute, raise your hand, let us know. I'm always willing like to, to jump in. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> get the conversation Good. started. Um, so for me, it was taking on the COO role. Um, when I started here 16 years ago, I was hired uh, partly by uh, the, the guy who was directing our sales. And the sales arm was not under my umbrella initially. So taking on the COO role put him as a direct report to me. And he was part of hiring me. So that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for me, the one thing I could have done earlier was recognize that I was experiencing some imposter syndrome in the organization mm -hmm. and start to kind of work through that and just accept that there was going to be disruption and in, in taking it on. So that's 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 what I have to share. That's good. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, uh, for me, I got to tell you, my biggest challenge is, is challenging our CEO. <laughs> I don't have much of a risk aversion, but yeah. Um, when it comes to making big investments or um, making the changes we need to make, we tend to put our foot down on the brake because mm -hmm. there's some concern about the financial ramifications. Yeah. So for me, uh, you know, the, my takeaway is we got to do more homework. We got to do more ROI analysis. We got to put the business case together mm -hmm. and, and make it more uh, data driven um, in order to prove the point out. <clears throat> That's right. That's brilliant, right? And this is a great example of that. That dyadic exchange can really work in your favor for creating moderate risk orientation, which is the ideal. If you're if you're low on risk orientation, a CEO is high on risk orientation. Research would suggest that actually is the best in terms of creating the best entrepreneurial environment because you're really challenging each other, right? The CEO is challenging you to come with that adequate data. You're challenging the CEO to think outside the box and the potential and the growth. And, you know, it really is a superpower if you can create that perfect dyad. I mean, Julie, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, along slightly different lines, I had a situation recently where um, I had a key leader that I, I knew needed to go. And, but he managed my entire contact center, which was a pretty significant component of the business. And I had convinced myself that um, I needed to get all my ducks in a row. I needed to have, you know, who is going to take over? How are we going to, how are we going to actually manage this, this team of 200 people in his absence? Um, and what ultimately ended up happening is he actually uh, made a, um, we'll call it an HR misstep and got himself fired much faster than I was probably ready to actually let him go. But it forced me, you know, HR basically ripped the bandaid off for me. Um, yeah. What I discovered and what I could have done to get more comfortable with the risk was one, A, had I done some legit succession planning, I would have had a plan for this situation. So that's big lesson number one. But two, um, had I really role played what would happen if he just didn't show up for work one day, I think I would have discovered that what actually happened is that I had three leaders that were um, tangential to his world that absolutely stepped up and stepped in and yeah. we, we were great. So right. two things, role play, you know, actually ask yourself, okay, if they didn't, if they got hit by a bus tomorrow, what would I do? Sometimes you find people that you weren't even thinking about. Um, yeah. But boy, you know, succession planning, really important. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's hard to kind of really have your crystal ball and think about how it's all going to unfold. But it is a good reminder that you should put yourself in the mindset of if the worst case scenario happens, yeah. what is the absolute minimum that I would have? We call it a, an MVP in the in the development of, of software world, right? What's the most right. viable product that we could possibly put together? And that's yeah. getting at that bullet of the adequate threshold. Like what's enough to make sure that I know that this is gonna be fine. It's never gonna be perfect, but it's enough. 
Yeah. Great example. Yeah, and I see Mike, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, for us, it was doing a 360 degree organizational assessment. CEO had said, we need to do one of those. I said, yeah, we do. And of course, I would never say I was afraid to make that happen. I was just too busy and you know, <laughs> had to find the right person and, and organization and the cost. And then we have to figure out how we're going to implement all those changes that we'd be committed to make and all that kind of stuff. And then we did it by a little bit of a push from my CEO. And it's yeah. really an amazing experience for us. That's great. That's a great example, right? It's all, it's, it's, um, it's sometimes it's easier said than done, but sometimes you need that push off the ledge, so to speak, to like really make it happen. That's good. Yeah. Great examples. All right. Wonderful. Clayton, um, you know something? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Clayton had his hand up. Sure. If we're lacking time, no worries. We can move on. No, no, you're good. You're good. Plenty of time. Uh, I was just going to say, this was an interesting question for me. So when I joined the company, we were very much in full startup mode. This was a year and a half ago. And one of the things that had really nagged at me, I work in a staffing company, and we were using an employer of record at the time. And for those of you who aren't familiar, in the staffing world, you can use an employer of record to where you badge employees under that company. They handle payroll, billing, they do um, benefits, all of that type of stuff for your employees. But... What we were running into is that they just were making a ton of mistakes and it was impacting candidate experience. Their legal would always get in the way of signing our con of getting our contracts signed. So there was just a lot of problems that we were running into. Um, and so early on, we knew that this was something we had to move away from, but it's kind of challenging when you've built your business model around that to effectively change the engine of your airplane while you're in mid-flight. Yeah. Um, so it definitely kicked the can down the road for a couple months, but finally we got to a breaking point and just realized, look, we've got 50 people in this employer of record right now. We've got to pull them. We need to do a back office transformation. We have to figure out funding. We have to figure out new payroll platforms, new technology stacks for you know timesheets, all of this type of stuff, insurance benefits. And we needed to do it within a three month period. And wow. so for me, it was just one of those things where, you know, the quote that sticks out in my mind is the obstacle is the way. It's the name of a stoicism book out there. And so getting into this, it was just like, we have to dig in, we have to create a project team, we have to get through this because this is the only way forward that we'll be comfortable doing. And so after a while of kicking it down the road, just because of the risk, we just realized, you know what, you got to suck it up and get through it. Right. That's great. Like at some point, the risk gets, the risk goes in the other direction. It's like exactly. the risk of not doing it. Right. And like the timing of that can be really challenging, but it sounds like you were patient and said, okay, let's think about it. Think about it. Hey, now is the time to do it. Right. And a lot of times people have a hard time when they know that's the right thing to do, communicating to everybody else that, look, if we don't do it, here's the, here's the end result. So, you know, it's a it, fine balance, but you're right. It just keeps getting worse. And so it's inevitable. You have to do it. And so you just suck it up and go forward with it. Yeah, that's great. Great examples to all. Thank you so much, everybody for contributing. These are amazing comments. Okay, so a few um, key takeaways. Number one, become a calculated risk taker. Be, think about being in that moderate range, or if you're not in that moderate range, appreciate the differences in risk orientation of the others that you work with and be able to leverage those and have conversations that allow you to both shine in terms of your strengths or your tendencies as it relates to your psychographic differences. And then be purposeful in seeking out and organizing the knowns and the unknowns. And a lot of times that comes down to what's the key information I need? What's the adequate threshold that I'm going to be comfortable taking or making some type of change? So thinking about it in those terms of being a moderate risk orient, uh, risk oriented type person, that's the ideal mindset for an agile type approach to work. That's strategic agility. Okay, so we're going to do a quick halftime. I want to bring in Nick to talk for a little bit um, and let me do a come off screen share and then we'll jump back into the other two dimensions and I will let him take over for a second. I'll give you a, give you a little bit of a break after all of that intense discussion and, uh, and content and let him do his, uh, do his deal real quick. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Nick Scott. Introduced myself quickly at the beginning, but uh, I am the sales guy here at Cloverleaf. Uh, so I'm going to keep myself on a tight leash so I'm not hitting anybody over the head with the sales pitch. Um, but, you know, a couple of the things, I even saw something in the chat around, you know, different assessment tools. 
Um, a lot of the things that we're talking about here today, you know, understanding who has a higher risk orientation versus a lower risk orientation. How do we communicate effectively around these things as a team? Assessment tools are a really powerful way to understand yourself and your team members. And, you know, through the awesome automation and, and some of the features Cloverleaf has built out, we give you the ability to really operationalize that data and utilize it amongst you know, your leadership teams. Uh, so there's no sales pitch here. I'm going to be dropping a link in a chat to start a trial of Cloverleaf. If you want to test it out, see if it's something that might be helpful for yourself and your team. Um, if you don't have time to action that out of the chat here, you will be seeing a, uh, a follow-up email come through from Cloverleaf as well, which will give you access to that link. So that's my quick spiel. Kept myself on a tight leash. And uh, if you ever want the sales pitch, more than happy to give that to you on a separate time. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, make sure I get this back up here. Oops, wrong one. All right, can you guys see that okay? See the takeaways? Awesome, all right. So um, third dimension, let's do a quick poll again to get everybody excited about this uh, third dimension. This is a fun one. I wanna know which statement do you most strongly identify with? A, fake it till you make it, or B, I have no idea what I'm doing right now. It's gotta be one or the other. Fake it till you make it. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. I commented, Scott, that those are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you came in with that because that actually is going to be exactly what I was going to say is that they really aren't. They're not, they're you usually are a little bit of both. And we got a 50, almost a 50 50% exchange here. But here's why I brought up this specific prompt. So we got 57% fake it till you make it, 43%. I have no idea uh, what I'm doing right now. So um, interestingly, a lot of what previously we've illustrated in the research about having this idea of confidence and competence is really, really important in terms of people being willing to follow you, right? Whether you're a leader or whether you're a team member, right? We wanna exude confidence, self-esteem, because when we do, people are like, oh, well, this person really must know what they're doing and we must follow them. But there also has been a, a huge surge in people recognizing that given the complexities of the work environment and all the changes, it is absolutely impossible to know everything, right? So this whole idea of fake it till you make it is a little bit broken or unrealistic, right? So it's good to exude confidence and competence, but in a very different way. Instead of pretending like we know all the information, the best way to actually illustrate that we are competent is by saying, here's what I understand, here's what I don't understand. Be fully transparent in where you stand in the process and ask fantastic questions that allow you to get to this middle ground of how can I work towards understanding what it is that I'm doing, right? So I kind of forced this dichotomy, but in actuality, we kind of want a little bit of a moderate version of both, right? We want to be competent and confident, but at the same time, we want to be transparent and recognize that there's no way that all of us could actually illustrate um, that we know everything in any one situation. Okay, so this gets at number three, what's called collaborative transparency. Right? And like Nick was mentioning with the Cloverleaf application, this is something that we really, really believe in, is trying to help everybody build this sense of familiarity, confidence, and understanding when working with their peers. And recognizing that, number one, no one is omnipotent. No one knows everything. That's just impossible. And then also, perfectionism is counterproductive. Nobody's going to be perfect at everything they do and have everything figured out. And improvement takes experimentation. You have to iterate, you have to try things and give things a go, and then reflect and see what worked and what didn't. And so recognizing that, you know, those experiments will inevitably fail. So fake it till you make it is broken, but also, you know, saying, I have no idea what's going on right now is also not necessarily productive. It has to be uh, something in between. 
And so I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term psychological safety before. And I've done a lot of research on psychological safety and all those nerdy academic journals and looked at a lot of the research and trying to illustrate what actually improves psychological safety. And collaborative transparency is one of the most important predictors. So first off, what exactly is psychological safety? This is a team-based phenomenon where people feel comfortable admitting mistakes, asking dumb questions, and speaking up. Right? And we've all been in those scenarios where we actually feel the opposite, right? We don't want to tell people if we don't understand what's going on or that we made a mistake. We don't want to speak up and ask the question about clarifying or making sure we're on the same page. We don't speak up. We just kind of stay muffled because we're, we're worried about it. It might rock the boat or something like that, right? Teams are way more effective when they feel psychologically safe. And a lot of the, the conversation out there in, in the pop press is like, yeah, you want to create psychological safety. It's really important. But where they stop short is saying how to create psychological safety. Having a sense of a collaborative transparency type mindset individually, as well as in teams, is what's going to help get there. Um, so now I want to do a breakout session to reflect on this specific point of collaborative transparency. So what's one thing that have that you have done that has contributed to psychological safety? And again, think about collaborative transparency and how to create that type of mindset. And then maybe what's thing, something you could have done uh, differently or something you could do in the future to help chip away at this idea of psychological safety. I've done this breakout a lot before and people usually have a ton to say about psychological safety whether they currently feel it in their teams, whether they're working on it in their teams, and what they're doing to try and change that, what we would call antecedent of psychological safety, which is building and flexing on collaborative transparency. So let's do a breakout room. We'll do the same thing we did for the first dimension, give you five minutes to talk about it with a handful of others, and then we'll bring you back in for a group conversation. Five groups, six groups come back at the same time. <laughs> oh, All right, we got 32 back. I think there was 35. There might be three more people. I think somebody might have dropped off when we went to breakouts. Okay. Cool. I had to apologize to my group because I hit the button too fast <laughs> and I jumped out of somebody who was saying something great and I missed it. So I'm you, really sorry. You just <laughs> used all the great accolades for you. That's what you missed. Uh, <laughs> truth, truth be told, Julie was telling us she just she didn't feel very psychologically safe in that breakout room. She was like, I got to get out of here. I'm done. <laughs> what? I hope everybody had a good conversation. Um, this is always one that usually has lots of people that are interested in telling a story, but we'll see how many we can we can field here uh, before we move on to this last dimension. We want to get us started about something that you've done that's contributed or something you could do differently to contribute to psych safety and thinking about this collaborative transparency type mindset. Well, I, I, will, I will jump in if nobody else wants to pipe up. Um, so this is a thing that is incredibly ingrained in our business. Um, it starts from the, the top. The CEO is an entrepreneur who understood in order to succeed at being an entrepreneur, he had to fail a lot. And he had to fail fast because that was the only way he was going to get to probably the thing that is successful. So... It is extraordinarily embedded, like we actually go through it in onboarding, that failure is expected. And that um, if you, you know, if you launch something that's perfect, you took too long. We, we have this expectation that you're never going to get it perfect on the first round. So just get it out fast so you can start learning. And we actually have, we usually have about five, you know, company priorities each quarter and we have the teams get up and present the results of the work that they did. And we expect that they will showcase the failures that they had throughout the quarter that led to wherever they got to. And we very much hold up and give the accolades to the groups that honestly fail the most and fail the fastest. So we're showcasing at a company level that failure is actually expected not to be feared. Yeah, that's great. 
and mm-hmm. you're 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 not only hitting on like this idea of the collaborative transparency but you're also getting at another component which is as leaders role modeling the importance of collaborative transparency because as leaders of our organizations research is pretty clear everybody is watching what you do and what you say and they are mimicking they're role modeling those behaviors to say hey if this is what leadership is doing they're saying failure is okay they're admitting their mistakes they're admitting that they don't know all the answers they're going to start doing the same right there is this trickle down model of leadership as it's called I, I jumped in a little bit late here but i'll piggyback on what julie was saying um we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years i spent a lot of time just encouraging folks to you know help them to make a decision have some conviction in the decision and then run with it right and then really where the modeling comes in with the safety is when it doesn't go as planned saying, Mm -hmm. hey, that's all right, and working through and then building upon what they've learned. And the other thing I would say is, you know, Todd, Julie was in my group, and I'm like, wow, what an interesting thing from top down, because a lot of these companies are built from sales folks, and sales folks hate losing and hate to admit failure. So it's almost coaching both ways, right? Being able to say to the people working for you, this is okay, and maybe to the people working above you, hey, this is okay, and highlighting how it's it's not a failure necessarily to fail, but it's a failure to succeed, right? Yeah. And how, how do you how do you share that with folks? That's good. It's a good tie into our fourth dimension as well about this idea of reflection. We'll hit on that one second. We'll hit on that one in a second. That's good. Anybody else want to offer theirs? I'll um, chime in on what I was saying, because, yeah, there's the bigger picture, but there's also, a, we are sitting in a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, st- strategies and variations, and somebody has to ask the dumb questions, and I just got used to early on, uh, I was telling my group, even back, you know, back in the school days and whatnot, so there's always that question that some, you know, other people have the same question, so yes. ask it, and that kind of opens the door, but we, I have, I'm opposite, I'm an engineering-focused company, and so we have a lot of that's a, with PhDs, you know, if you, you have a strong mindset and you have to yes. do things this way. And so yeah. they're dominating characters in, mm-hmm. in meetings. And so watching the audience and knowing, and somebody said, um, one of my person in my group said you have questions like in your pocket to be able to draw people into the meeting yeah. to make the safe the space safe for people mm-hmm. to make sure that they can contribute and feel comfortable asking those dumb questions when you have strong um, people in the meetings that tend to dominate so yeah. like watch especially on video watching the the signals and, and facial expressions and engagement and uh, you know that they have something to say but they're not saying anything because mm-hmm. you just watch that reaction so you know gently calling in people hey what's your thoughts or opinions so making sure that you're constantly you know engaging and then you get people in that habit of no it is safe and it was okay to ask those questions or question you know question something or make those mistakes that's a great 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 addition one thing i'll point out that it's also illustrated in research that when you have what's called power differentials within a team space you have a higher likelihood of psychological safety being squashed through this lack of collaborative transparency because the higher the more difference you have the more people get a little bit scared about whether or not that person up top is going to you know expect a certain thing so we have to be careful with those uh very good i see deborah you've got your hand up well i have had um a very tactical experience with trying to create team psychological safety and that was that i had two co-founders in one of the startups that I worked with that were constantly fighting with each other very loudly. And it would affect, I mean, it would reverberate down the hallways sometimes. I had to go in and, uh, you know, calm them down if I could, and then go to the teams or the people that could hear and be a shield for that behavior. And has the psychological safety for them was like, gosh, are we going to lose our job? Is there no money coming in? Are we, you know, like whatever it was that they were arguing and then training up to be like, you guys need to take this elsewhere. Yeah, that's hard. (laughs) Very hard to do, right? When you're seeing others that aren't signaling this idea of collaborative transparency and being fair with the conversations. But 
a worthy cause, obviously, because you've recognized how important it is because they're role modeling the appropriate behaviors. That's great. And then Catherine, we'll do this last one with Catherine and then we'll go to the last dimension. Yeah, I want to flag that um, I, I, talking about psychological safety without um, bringing up impacts of race and equity and white supremacy culture, I think is, is means we're not we're only having half the conversation. I don't think yeah. in a diverse workplace, you can even begin to tackle psychological safety for all of your employees. If you're not also looking at equity and, and your culture and how uh, race um, shows up and doesn't show yeah. up, especially amongst your leadership. Yep. Fantastic. Yes. And research points to everything you're describing. And this is a whole nother presentation <laughs> for another day. But to offer a few important points to what Catherine is saying, research is illustrating that there's a real difference as we've moved to virtual communication and virtual interactions within the workplace. So interestingly, uh, females as well as minorities have been more likely to opt for the virtual options of work as opposed to the face-to-face -face options of work. And when you, so when you, as an organization, offer all these opportunities to say, do what you think is best for you, you're seeing females and minorities opt more for virtual work. And that's potentially problematic because you have what's called in-office advantage. Those that are in office more tend to be more involved in the politics. They tend to get more opportunities. They tend to get more developmental opportunities. So we've made decent strides, I think, as a community towards at least recognizing and at least having some terminology for what is D, E, I, and B. And that's important. That's a start. But I also worry that we're at this point where because virtual technology is kind of creating this new environment, we're actually not paying attention to that's going to actually perpetuate some of the issues that we've been solving for or attempting to solve for a long time. So Catherine makes a really important point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, okay, this is great. Let's talk about this last dimension of um, psychological safety and, or excuse me, of uh, an agile mindset. But first, four takeaways for collaborative transparency. Number one, don't pretend like you know everything. Instead, just ask fantastic questions. Don't be afraid to speak up. Your end goal should really be, what's the right mindset for creating psychological safety? And number four, create what's called personal and professional familiarity. And so I've done a lot of research in this area, especially as we move to virtual work. And this is something that we've done with our, our Cloverleaf tool as well, is illustrating that those that do use the Cloverleaf application to become more familiar personally as well as professionally with those that they work for. And as familiarity increases in terms of like, who are they? How do they operate? What are their strengths, weaknesses, blind spots? The more familiar we become with others, the more likely we are to engage in team collaboration, psychological safety, and the like. Okay, final poll, and then I'll run through this last dimension. So how well do you understand <clears throat> what's called the agile framework? Right? This is more of the the scrum agile framework type mentality. So I have no idea. Is that a workout routine? B, I have enough to be dangerous. Or C, I am an agile ninja and can teach it to others. Let's see where you guys stand. Okay. And I think we need to put this in the chat because I did not have this poll. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah let's my just do... No, I probably just missed this last one. So send us a chat, say uh, A, B, or C. Let's see what we can do in terms of a quick breakdown here. See a lot of these so far. We know enough to be dangerous as a group. <laughs> we're already being, uh, in terms of collaborative intelligence, we're being honest about where we reside here. Uh, but some of you think it's a workout routine. It's not a workout routine. Um, so agile mindset, this is really about, um, excuse me, this idea of um, a retrospective has actually been hinted at multiple times throughout the conversation. And so what is a good way to make sure that we're adjusting and adapting on the fly as a team? And one way to think of it is that anytime we work together as a team, there are what's called performance episodes. So when we get together as a team, and this might be for a departmental deliverable on a quarterly basis, or maybe for a project team that has some specific thing they're trying to figure out, we come together and we're forming and we're trying to figure out who does what and what their background is. 
And then we're storming, right? We're kind of figuring out what's the right thing to do or maybe engaging in constructive controversy. And then we're norming where we decide, okay, this is the plan. This is how we're going to move forward. Then we're performing and we execute whatever we've decided upon. And then people stop. Right? We submitted the deliverable. Great. We're done. The stage that people forget is what's called adjourning. During the adjourning stage is where the team retrospective and the team reflection happens. That's where we actually learn how to be more agile for the future. So you can evaluate things like the individuals, who did what and how did they do it, the interactions between individuals, what were the processes that we used and what worked and didn't work, what tools did we use versus what should we have used, and how much progress did we make in terms of learning or uh, accomplishing the objectives at large. So the four key questions that all this should be asking as we get through performance episodes, what went well, what did not go well, what did we learn, and what should we do differently next time? Right? So the more that we can create systems about having this agile mindset, engaging in team reflections, the better. So here's the reflection, and I don't, we're not going to go offline and, and do a breakout or do a journaling because of time. I want to leave some additional time for just discussing everything that we've talked about so far before we take off together. But this is the prompt that I would encourage everybody to consider. What can you do to create, encourage, or facilitate an agile approach to team reflections? So some of us have this built into our system and we already are using Scrum and Agile framework, and that's a good structure for doing it. But it also doesn't have to be that formal, right? It can be done just on one-on-ones. It can be done with peer-to-peer -peer relationships. It can be done at the end of a specific project or even at the a quarterly offsite meeting, right? So all of these opportunities in asking these questions enable us to be more reflective on what could we potentially do different. Right, so key takeaways, agile mindsets facilitate team effectiveness in demanding VUCA environments. VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And all of us are working in these VUCA environments and it's becoming even more challenging as we go through all these societal changes and have crises like COVID and the pandemic happening, right? So reflections, those are actually the beginnings of the agile opportunities, right? So they're at the end of team interaction, but those are the opportunities where we learn a lot about what to do differently. Um, so here's the big summary, right? Don't forget, Tia Tume, the CrossFit champion, right? The agile mindset. It's never just going to be one thing. It's multiple things. It's being able to adjust and adapt. It's being able to do things that you are interacting with all of these different substances to make sure that it all comes together perfectly, right? So that is the agile framework. So the visual to remember is the CrossFit champion here. But in summary, these four dimensions are hopefully what you'll remember today. So forward thinking, right? Not just task performance, but adaptive and proactive. Start using that language for your own reflections as well as when you're interacting with others. Manage risk, but think about being a moderate risk orientation, right? Not too low, not too high, but in the middle, right? And partner with others and work towards others towards having that moderate mindset. Collaborative transparency, right? Psychological safety is clearly important, but to create psychological safety takes a very specific mindset for you and your team. It's not fake it till you make it, but it's not pretending like you know all the answers, right? It's asking the good questions, not being afraid to admit what you don't know and doing your homework to figure it out. And then finally, the agile mindset. If you're going to make this work within an organizational environment, when you do your reflections, those are the best opportunities to make sure you circle back and actually facilitate all of this type of agile thinking within an organizational setting. Um, so that's all I had. I know we've got about another minute or two. If there's a, a final question or comment, I'll let Laura decide what, what to do next. Um, but if you're interested in Cloverleaf, reach out to Nick. I know you guys have that, uh, you have that link for a team trial if you're interested. We strongly believe in this idea of growth and development in team settings. And if you're interested in this type of stuff, I've got a bunch of assessments, newsletters, and all sorts of fun stuff uh, through my website. So you guys have been a really fun group. Thank you so much for all the interaction and for all the insights and in comments about what you're experiencing that has made this made this so much fun absolutely you know i I'm, I'm gonna end it at that and not take questions just because we let everybody get to work i really appreciate the time that you took to spend with us today scott and as well as with you nick and um 
Nick will be reaching out to you with some information on Cloverleaf. I encourage you to try it. It's a free assessment. We're using it at the CEO Forum. Um, our coaching program is using it in their assessments as well. And it's it's worth it's worth dipping your toes in it a little bit. And Nick can answer any questions that, that you might have. I have a very short survey at the end of this that I'm trying because I would love to get your feedback on other topics that Scott might be able to come back to us with. And it should take you maybe 30 seconds just to click the buttons on that one. So very much, Scott, thanks for being here. And thanks all of you for joining us and for contributing and being a part and active in the conversations. And thanks we'll everybody. In our next session. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.